welcome. My name is Chris Ajamian. I am CEO and founder of Kate's and your co-host for today. I hope that you're all doing well. Um, our topic today is how to make the most of high school. Once again, I'm joined by Michael Muska, a dear friend and mentor who has worked in admissions offices at Brown, Cornell, Oberlin, among many others. Uh, and he has spent decades as a coach and educator and now runs uh, Relativity College Consulting. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we were chatting before, but you're doing, you're doing pretty well, yeah? Yep, my pleasure. Good to see you as always. And I love how you always have the right uh, sort of shirt to match the colors uh, behind you in your background. You're always you're always quite dashing in that way. I do um, my best. <laughs> so, like always, I'm going to facilitate the conversation. Um, if you have any questions at any point in time, please ask them in the Q and A panel, which you can access by scrolling over the bottom of your screen. Uh, additionally, for the best experience, you may want to set your screen to gallery view, which you can do by scrolling over the top right corner of your browser window and selecting gallery. You may also want to click view options at the top of your screen to select side by side mode. So that Michael and I appear side by side on your screen and next to the slides in the same window. And as for today's discussion, here's what we're talking about. Um, so, you know, often we look at high school as a time in which students are preparing for higher education, rather than as a period of development in its own right. And while college prep is certainly a major goal of high school, there are many other ways that students um, can use their high school years to develop the skills and knowledge they will need, whatever future they may pursue. So today we're gonna to take a break actually from our usual focus on, um, or our hyper-focus on college admissions and talk about what it means to make the most of high school. And we'll talk about that in terms of de developing skills, building character, making connections and taking um, advantage of extracurriculars and um, you know the way that uh, today's experience is gonna run is I'll present the different ideas from what we might be suggesting to students. And then Michael is actually gonna chime in and talk about how these different points play out from the perspective of the educator or the guidance counselor, um, and then also connect these to um, college admissions along the way. Um, but again, if you have any questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, um, you know, please put them in the Q&A panel. And then um, also if there's, uh, you know, a question that you have that we don't get to today, or if there's a private matter that you want to discuss, please feel free to get in touch with us directly. You can email us at info at or hello at relativitycc.com or call us on the numbers, um, you know, uh, that you see on the screen. So developing skills, um, and we're going to start off with executive functioning. So sometimes um, executive functioning can be described as the management system of the brain. Uh, executive functions are mental skills, including self-control, flexible thinking, and working memory. We use these skills every day to learn, work, and manage daily life. And building these skills in high school will set students on a path for success in college and beyond. Executive functioning is a huge topic. Uh, one that's well worth exploring in uh, more depth if your student has trouble with focus, uh, completing tasks, or handling emotions. But for today, we're going to focus on sharing tips and techniques in two areas that are especially relevant for high schoolers, uh, specifically time management and self-regulation. So time management and planning. So a couple of bullets here. You know, number one, build routines. So maintaining a regular routine helps daily activities feel organized and you know, importantly, predictable. Daily tasks that become second nature, um, allowing kids to devote their mental energy to more challenging, rewarding tasks is, is a key, right? So this lowers stress, it improves focus and increases productivity. And high school is a great time for kids to take the lead on managing their own schedule and building their own routines. And helpful routines might include set times for waking up and going to bed and regular times to complete their homework, exercise, clean their bedroom, and, and, and so on. And whatever your student decides, it's important to continue practicing these routines and keep them as consistent as possible. Um, we did a useful segment on this uh, in terms of setting up daily routines back in our first ever webinar um, from March 25, 25th, 2020 titled uh, Best Practices for Remote Learning. So you can go onto the Kate's website, go to our webinars page, scroll to the bottom, and you'll find that webinar there. 
but also uh, we talked about this in that webinar, use calendars and, uh, and a planner of some sort. So planners and cal calendars are really vital tools for organization and there's no better time to form the habit than in high school and frankly, maybe even middle school. So between classes, extracurricular activities, socializing, college prep and really everything else, your high schoolers will have to probably be juggling a lot of tasks, you know, much more than they've ever faced before. And you want to encourage your uh, your student to, to note down every assignment, due date, test, deadline, appointment, as well as social activities, uh, study schedules, extracurriculars, and so on, so on, to, to keep themselves, you know, sort of on track. This may seem obvious to some, but for some, it's, it's actually not. Um, and adults, i.e., like people in the viewing audience, most likely. You want to probably model this behavior by using your planners and your calendars or whatever you know systems you use on a regular basis. You know, maybe even consider uh, setting up a shared uh, family calendar and encourage your child to contribute to managing it. You know, obviously with proper guidance. Um, and then, you know, furthermore, this idea of uh, practicing uh, task management, uh, task management, effective task management, really helps students achieve their goals and again minimizes stress by practicing task management skills. Now, students will also be able to. You know, so take on like, you know, longer and more complex projects that they're going to likely encounter maybe deeper in high school, in college, as well as, of course, in the workplace. And one of the easiest and most effective supports for task management is the simple checklist. Building checklists for each project helps students, um, you know, break down potentially overwhelming tasks into manageable chunks, provide structure to keep the students on track and helps them put an end goal in sight. And again, you want to probably try to model this behavior yourself uh, to guide your, your student on how to apply to their own life. And then finally, you know, learning your limits and using time selectively. Lots of high schoolers feel pressure to overcommit themselves uh, to take that seventh day PE or to join that third sports team. But an important skill for all of us is to learn, you know, when to say no. While students should always seek a healthy challenge in their in their academics and their extracurricular pursuits, they should also strive for balance and listen to the needs of their bodies and their minds. It's important for high schoolers to leave some time to relax and just be a kid, right? Um, so, in other words, students should be wary of piling on commitments for the sake of it. Um, or to, to, to please the college admissions gods. Um, and instead, you know, you want to encourage your student to say yes only to the opportunities that truly excite them or that are truly necessary. So, Michael, I mean, time management and planning, um, you know, you've seen this play out in various ways for students. You know, what are you usually advising your students with respect to these, um, to these bullets? Um, and how do you think um, they need to apply them in a way that makes sense and so not so overwhelmed? Well, I, I think there's no question how important this is and that for many parents, it's very difficult for them to figure out how they interject their thoughts in it while letting it still be the choice of their child. And I think many times that's probably can be a, a point of, of tension at times in terms of, you know, the child may want to do all these things or the parent may want them to do all these things. And, you know, creating a balance between the relationship of the parent and the child in terms of making this work. I loved your point before about the idea of being able to have your child be able to model your own behavior as a parent, you know, that you're on a schedule, that you manage your time, that you look like you know what you're doing, and that you've made choices yourself in terms of what we can do and what we can't do. You know, so I think in a lot of ways, exactly what you said really is, is important. And I think from a parent's peace of mind, knowing that their child has developed these skills before they go off to college will help them feel much better when they do leave to go to college, that they're ready to tackle what's going to be before them because they've done these kinds of things in terms of managing their time before. And I think something to add to that now that I'm sort of hearing you talk through these points is looking at the college application process. We were talking to one of our parents, um, a parent of one of the students we work with uh, maybe last week um, about uh, our college essay workshop that we have done in the past. And the college wor essay workshop came uh, to be because you know parents wanted a way to give their students a very sort of like concentrated and structured way of getting their applications done. I know that one of the things that kind of plays out in the college admissions advising um, you know, uh, process is it's literally task management. And if for no other reason, it's getting them ready for the application season when they're seniors, um, this idea of task management seems like a, you know, a, a pretty critical skill to develop. I mean, I'm working with a number of students right now, and I've stressed to them how important it was to get our essays done during the summer. Because yeah. back in terms of time management, you're going to have all these things on your plate in terms of what you want to do when you return to school. And school hopefully is going back to normal in terms of you know, post-COVID where they're going to be able to be in their activities, be allowed to be in sports. 
And if they haven't gotten some of this done before the fact during the summer, they're going to be behind the eight ball in terms of getting ready in the college process. So again, thinking ahead in terms of how these skills can then transfer once they get into being the summer after junior year in high school to get ready for the college applications. So um, moving along here, self-regulation. Uh, so the challenge of self-regulation is particularly acute for high schoolers, um, you know, who are, you know, you know, who you know, are faced all at once with a rapidly expanding social network, heightened academic challenges, in, you know, increased after-school obligations and new levels of independence and autonomy and anxieties about college and careers, you know, all mixed with a potent cocktail of teenage hormones. Um, it's a lot to deal with and many kids have a really hard time, but there are, you know, a number of effective research-backed techniques to help students with this challenge. We wanna talk about a few of those right now. So first, this idea of practicing self-talk and critical reflection. So positive self-talk is a highly valuable tool for every student. Um, you know, you want to encourage your students to speak positive words of encouragement to themselves in moments of, you know, stress, anxiety, and self-doubt. Um, in 2019, researchers found that when 9 to 13-year-old students took five minutes before a test and, quote, silently spoke words of encouragement to themselves that were focused on effort, end quote, um, math scores improved. What's more, uh, there's a growing body of research that suggests that giving students scheduled time to talk to themselves through challenges, including study habits, sporting events, and uh, academic projects improves outcomes. So if your student struggles to get past the awkwardness of talking to themselves, a similar benefit can be found in writing about anxiety and provoking experiences. There was another study done in 2019. This one focused on a pre-exam expressive writing task and concluded that when high school school when high school students wrote for just 10 minutes about an upcoming exam, reframing their anxiety as a beneficial and energizing force, course failure rates dropped significantly. So to help their kids, you know, cope with stressful experiences like exams or arguments, you know, with friends, you know, parents can coach kids on strategies to step outside of their own perspective and reflect on issues with some distance. You know, this might mean asking them to reconsider a problem from someone else's viewpoint. You know, like for example, you know, what advice would you give your closest friend um, if they came to you with this problem uh, or helping them to reframe and talk about the problem in a more positive and challenge oriented way. Additionally, this idea of finding a purpose. Uh, research has also shown that students who are, are, are more motivated to perform at their best when they have a core purpose. In one example, researchers asked high school students, uh, particularly seniors, to connect their education to a higher purpose by choosing uh, an injustice they found particularly egregious and writing a solutions-oriented essay about it before writing a separate essay to future students describing how learning can make the world a better place. This same study also asked ninth graders to talk about um, and write about a purpose uh, beyond personal success in their future careers, such as protecting the environment or feeding the hungry. And from this single intervention, students who connected their learning to purpose improve their grades, attended and finished you know, college at higher rates, and spent almost twice as much time on boring but important academic tests, so academic tasks. So, and if you've attended you know, any of our other webinars, you know, you'll know that this idea of finding a core purpose and connecting to all that you do is the bedrock you know, of our company as well as Michael's. And it's one of the reasons why Michael and I love to collaborate so closely because we would kind of share um, you know, this ethos. So you, know, you can help your student to connect uh, learning to purpose by talking about their goals and purpose in life and discussing the steps required to to reach these goals. Um, and, you know, you want to encourage your student to think more concretely about what interests them and what they might like to achieve in their future and help them see the link between what they're studying in school and what their goals are in real life. So identifying and researching interesting careers linked to ongoing schoolwork is another helpful strategy. And we'll, we'll talk more about discovering interests and passions in, 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 a, in a bit. Um, but also this idea of learning how to de-stress. Stress is an inevitable part of life. I think we'd all agree with that. And one that um, we also uh, each manage a little differently. So high schoolers should start to build the skill uh, and experiment to find out which strategies work best for them. They may try going for a run uh, or meditating, chatting with a friend, watching uh, you know, a silly sitcom or playing with dog, whatever it is. Um, 
you know, uh, students want to find out what relaxes them and take breaks to distress early and often to prevent these negative feelings from building up into something more serious. And parents, again, evaluate how you handle stress. Um, you know, we talk about this a lot in the, in the standardized testing webinars that we do. Um, you know, your students are going to model the same way um, of handling, you know, challenge and stress that they see you exhibiting, right? So, you know, they're going to they're gonna mimic your stress management behaviors, right? Um, and so you want to ask yourself, are you setting a healthy example for your child? Um, so, Michael, before we sort of move on, um, when it comes to self-regulation and this idea of, you know, core purpose and, you know, self positive self talk and learning how to de stress, you know, anything you want to add uh, based on your experience. I wrote a book a few years ago called Getting In. And one of the chapters I talked about the fact that a student needs to be able to look at themselves in a mirror and do exactly what Chris is talking about here. But I wrote it from the, from the point of view of looking at themselves in the mirror as they start to think about their college choices. You know, be honest and realistic with yourself as you look in that mirror of, are these appropriate choice schools for me? You know, are this an appropriate major for me? Is this an appropriate place where I want to go to college? And to be able to be honest with you and those, with yourself in those kinds of conversations and reflections. So by building this up, as Chris is kind of implying right now, at a younger age, in the ninth grade, in the 10th grade, a student's going to be much, much more able to do that in terms of looking at the college process and being much more honest with themselves as they critically reflect on what makes sense for them. So um, we'll talk now about uh, academic and study skills. So high school is a great time to start building academic and study skills <laughs> that are gonna be important um, to success in college and beyond. Uh, most high schools don't teach these skills in depth, um, if at all. So your students should be prepared to learn them independently or, you know, with the help of a, a tutor or a guide or a mentor or a teacher uh, and to keep practicing them on a regular basis. And there's a few things that we like to recommend that you focus on, uh, first of which being note taking. Uh, taking good notes is one of the most valuable skills a student can have, and there is myriad different note taking techniques and systems out there. So we encourage students to experiment and find ones that work for them. Uh, there are lots of guides and resources online, including on college websites that will be helpful in the process. Um, also making and keeping a study schedule. We spoke about, um, you know, earlier about planning and using calendars, but um, I wanna emphasize again, the importance of keeping a study schedule. This may not come naturally to your student, which is why it's important to keep practicing with it. Um, also creating a dedicated uh, homework and study space. Context is key to successful studying and learning. Uh, when I say context, I mean like physical context, environmental, mood context. And students want to create a distraction-free zone in which to work, um, making sure that you know in advance they have everything, you know, everything that they need in hand, being sure to turn off notifications on their phones, their computers, closing down TikTok, um, putting themselves in the right headspace to, to do the work the right way. And parents can help by respecting the student's workspace and choosing carefully if and when to enter it. Um, so you're not a distraction. Um, and also finally, this idea of taking breaks. Um, you know, regular short breaks are an essential part of productive work habits. And your student might wish to try different methods such as the Pomodoro technique, which is a, uses a timer to break work into intervals, traditionally 25 minutes in length and separated by five minute breaks. In addition, students should also try to incorporate movement into breaks, whether that means walking around the block, doing some jumping jacks or simply stretching. And then just wanna kind of share a couple of um, memorization and study techniques here, you know, space repetition, flashcards, mind mapping, over learning, and there's many more. Um, Michael, anything you wanna say here about academic and study skills, anything to add? I think a lot of it parallels what you said earlier about time management and building the schedule and having a routine, you know, having a, a, a planner and a guide that perhaps says we're going to study this subject for this period of time, this subject for this period of time, and this subject for this period of time to really kind of, you know, map out what you're trying to do in the course of an evening. And again, back as we're saying before, in terms of parents helping your child build this kind of routine, build this kind of schedule without you having to interject. The more that the student learns to self-initiate these kinds of things, the far more effective they're going to be. Agreed. Uh, well said, Michael. Social skills. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to dive too deeply into building social skills, uh, but suffice it to say, um, you know, this is a pivotal part of high school development. During high school, students should try to seek out experiences that allow them to practice, you know, speaking to people they disagree with, 
advocating for themselves or their position, uh, speaking to people with different backgrounds, uh, having quote unquote difficult conversations and speaking to authority figures. And I think a really great way to approach building social skills is let your students' needs in this arena inform which extracurriculars they, they choose. So for instance, a student who may struggle with speaking up for themselves uh, may learn a lot from joining the debate team or even like the mock trial club. Um, and then also finally, um, you know, you know, read. Uh, regular reading is the closest thing we have to a magic bullet when it comes to skill development. So we wanna encourage your student to read widely and read often, whether it's, you know, books or magazines or newspapers or, you know, um, you know whether it's on paper or online, um, you know, and, and whatever they read is gonna help with their reading, their speaking, their thinking, um, you know, their, their ability to connect dots. Um, it's, it's again, a magic bullet. So, um, Michael, we're sort of wrapping up this segment here um, on, uh, on skills. Uh, anything else you want to say about social skills or about, you know, the value of, of, of reading and reading and reading? I think this last thing that you have right here is really important in terms of parents, the example that they set for their children. You know, a parent who sits around and picks up a book and reads it is sending an incredibly strong message to their child in terms of the fact of the value of reading. And I think the more that we can get them away, and again, yes, they can read on their computers, but the more we can get them away a little bit from reading everything on a screen and perhaps learning the joy and the beauty of reading a book. Um, I think I personally have gone back to books so much during the COVID time. Absolutely. And it's something, it's something that I've loved that I've recaptured. I've probably been, I've read more books in the last year than I probably read in the last 10 years. But you know, it, it says something in terms of the example and the message that you give to your children by you doing that and getting them to get a love of reading and a love of learning. So um, next segment here, we're talking about building character. So as well as the concrete skills, high school is also a time when students can accelerate the development of something that's equally important, but a little harder to define this idea of character. Um, the nonprofit organization Character Lab describes character as quote, everything we do to help other people as well as ourselves, um, end quote, and divides the concept into three dimensions, strength of heart, such as gratitude, strengths of will, such as grit and self-control, and strengths of mind, uh, such as curiosity. And if you're going, if you're interested in supporting your child's character development, we highly recommend checking out uh, the resource library here um, on Character Lab's website. Um, but for now, we're going to highlight two key areas, uh, grit and resilience, and empathy and kindness um, in this next segment. All right, so grit and resilience. So developing a, an embracing a growth mindset. So a fixed mindset can cause struggling learners to feel stuck on a problem and reduces their belief that they can improve. An everyday example um, would be a student who claims they are quote unquote, just bad at math. Students with a fixed mindset tend to have a harder time accepting feedback and may view their intelligence or abilities as unchanging and thus fail to see a link between effort and improvement. By contrast, a growth mindset means that uh, learners believe that they can grow with skills um, uh, and can grow their skills with effort and uh, perseverance. And fostering growth mindset is an ongoing project, but parents can help students by offering words of support and encouragement, by guiding students to reframe negative emotions or thought patterns, and by nudging the student to take on new challenges, even, you know, more especially scary ones. During our last webinar, we went into depth on strategies for high school class selection, um, but here's one more that relates specifically to the question of building a growth mindset. Encourage your student at least once in high school to take a class that really scares them. When they know that's gonna, you know, require them to stretch their brain to its limits. Um, this experience is gonna make them a stronger student and learning to enjoy academic challenges will leave students better able to take them on and succeed in the future. Um, also, expose your child to positive role models. Um, children and teens often mimic attitudes and behaviors from adults in their lives as a result, providing them with opportunities to learn from positive resilient adults is key to building grit. So consider setting up a conversation between your teen and a grandparent, a neighbor, a family friend, or another acquaintance who has worked hard towards a long-term goal. Um, I think hearing these real-life stories from a trusted adult can help teens understand and internalize the benefits that come with passion and perseverance. 
Similarly, you may wish to share stories about resilient famous people who persevered toward, uh, towards long-term goals despite failures or setbacks along the way. And you should share your own stories with your teen as well. Ultimately, it's valuable for kids to understand that even adults can make mistakes, um, but then to try again and to eventually solve a problem or to reach a goal. Um, and then just a few more things here, you know, having uh, open conversations about challenges and struggles. Uh, open conversation is a key to helping teens work through whatever struggles they may be facing in a productive way. Try to non-judgmentally talk through any problems or situations that are, that are causing difficulties. And instead of immediately suggesting solutions, try simply restating the problem in your own words and allowing your child to come to their own solutions. Uh, also, and I love this last piece, the hard thing rule. So Angela Duckworth, um, who's a very famous researcher and professor at UPenn and the founder, uh, co-founder of Character Lab, um, she teaches grit to her own daughters using the hard thing rule. And she has one of the most famous TED Talks on grit that, um, you know, that there ever was and highly recommend that you check it out. But when it comes to the hard thing rule, um, you know, Duckworth and her family, you know, they have uh, these interesting guidelines, you know, where each member of the family um, parents included, uh, has to choose a hard thing to pursue. This could be a musical instrument, a sport, an activity, anything that requires practice, where you're going to get feedback, um, you know, telling you how you're going to have to get better and that you're forced to get back in there and try again and again. So, you know, um, you know whatever it is, you also have to finish what you start. And Duckworth requires her kids to finish a season, a set of lessons they signed up for, et cetera. Um, and also, no one gets to pick the hard thing for anyone else. So your child chooses their own challenge. Um, and this last point on this, this, this exercise brings the whole family together and a set of shared challenges. Um, and uh, you know, it allows you to kind of hold each other accountable and also talk openly about any challenges that you're facing, um, as well as provides an opportunity for the adults to model resilience and perseverance when they encounter uh, difficulties in, in their hard thing. So Michael, anything you want to add here about grit and resilience and some of these ideas? Yeah, we're sharing uh, certainly, certainly the message last year from college admissions deans was this is what they were looking for in students, particularly as students were wrestling with what they were going through with COVID. And the students that could show grit and show resilience and the next point that we're going to come up with in a second in terms of empathy, but the students that could do those kinds of things and demonstrate it instead of sitting around feeling sorry for themselves because they couldn't do their normal activities, they couldn't play their sports. Those are the kinds of people that deans of admissions were looking for, for students to be telling those stories. And for those of the parents that are here of younger students, when you start to write the Common App, which is the central application for college admissions, they ask questions about struggles that you've overcome? What are some of the experiences you've had that might have held you back? How have you challenged yourself? So doing these kinds of things at a younger age will just simply prepare you to be much better to handle this in the college application process too. So another thing too, Michael, you and I talk about <clears throat> that we love you know, um, to go deep into is this idea of empathy and kindness. Um, do something good, right? Encourage your student to volunteer not to fulfill a class requirement or because they can use it on applications, but because it'll make them feel good and because they're a lot luckier than a lot of other people out there, probably. It doesn't need to be every single day or even every week, but students should make a commitment to give back at least once per month, we think, to a cause they identify with. So doing so will give them perspective on their own challenges and it is a good habit uh, to get into while, you know, while you're young. And also this idea of being kind. Uh, high schools are overflowing with insecure kids, right? Encourage your student to be kind to everybody they encounter and to decline to engage in gossip or other mean-spirited behavior. I know, easier said than done. But if you talk with your student about the importance of forming their own impressions of people, rather than judging them based on a secondhand opinion, um, that's going to be, you know, uh, you know, Awesome. Um, and you want to remind them that their classmates might be struggling with all kinds of challenges that they themselves have been lucky enough to avoid. And so being able to put yourself in the shoes of others is one of the most valuable character traits, you know, a student can build. I mean, Michael, would you agree? Absolutely. I, as I kind of alluded to just a couple minutes ago, deans of admissions were looking for grit and empathy. There's no question in terms of those being probably when families are saying, well, what else can we do to make our child stand out in the college admissions process? Genuine empathy, 
doing some kind of community service or program that's something that you care about, that you believe in, and that you want to continue to do, not just in college, but perhaps for the rest of your life. I know one of the things, Chris, you talk about is life skills and life passions and how they would carry on. And the student that's able to talk about, you know, we're talking here, hopefully to some younger parents, to talk to your child to getting involved in things in the ninth and 10th grade and not waiting till they're in the 11th and 12th grade and in this college panic, oh my God, we have to do some things to make my application look better. Let them be things they care about, things that they believe in and things where they make a difference in the world. Well put, Michael. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, making connections. Uh, this is our next segment here. So high school is a time when a student's social network will expand rapidly. As a result, high schoolers are going to benefit from being mindful and strategic <clears throat> as to as far as how they go about forming connections with all the new people that they're going to encounter. And uh, we've sort of selected a few of those new people here. So first of all, uh, peers, right? Social relationships in your teen years can feel all encompassing, uh, but students should know that a single person or group likely can't provide them with everything they need. Students need not feel that they have to stick with one group all the time um, and should try to make different kinds of friends in different contexts. You know, remind your teen to keep um, the social dynamics of their high school in perspective and not get hung up on high school popularity. Uh, high school is only four years and person the social standing in high school is ultimately probably trivial uh, in the wider scheme of their life. I wish someone had told me this when I was in high school. Michael, anything to add? Uh, it's interesting to me. I, you know, I've worked with a number of students who've written their essays exactly about this topic. You know, yeah. their ability to cross peer groups. You know, in other words, if I'm on a team but at lunch, I sit down with a different group of kids, or I make friends with the kids that are in the theater crowd. You know, you start to show that you have the ability to cross over and make those kinds of connections so that you're gonna interact better with other people. College deans of admissions wanna know that students are gonna be able to function in a world where they're not gonna be able to be in a group that's so similar to them. I have a student right now who's writing an essay that I absolutely adore, that he basically said to me, he said, I go to this Lily White private high school in New York City. But he said, the best thing in my life is when I go back home to my neighborhood down in the Rockaways and I go out and play basketball and I'm the only white guy on the court. You know, it's one of these things in terms of the ability to have that dynamic that in a city like New York, which is so diverse, to not get caught up in the microcosm of the world where you go to school, but to get involved in the entire world and the entire community, what it's all about. And it goes back to what we just talked about and perhaps your community service and your kindness will be in an area where you are being nice or working with somebody that is different from you. Yeah, I mean, I can say the same thing about, uh, you know, Falmouth, Maine, the same thing about London, the same thing about, you know, all these different contexts, you know, kind of making sure that you kind of break out of that bubble and you're able to develop the competencies and skills to integrate um, and collaborate with, you know, people different from you is, I mean, it's, I mean, is there any greater life skill uh, in the 21st century right now? I'm not so sure. Um, Michael, we're going to move on to uh, teachers and counselors. I'm certainly interested to kind of hear your feedback in a few moments, but um, teachers do far more than deliver class content and they can be helpful and dedicated mentors for students' personal development throughout high school and also beyond, right? Like some students stay in touch with their favorite teachers for years after graduation and from a college admissions perspective, building these general relations with teachers will allow those teachers to write, you know, pretty personal and persuasive letters of recommendation that are gonna help your uh, student's application really kind of stand out. So a couple of tips here for building some strong teacher relationships. You know, number one, start early. You know, simply put, the longer you have to build a relationship with the teacher, the better they will be able to get to know you and the stronger recommendation they're going to be able to write. Um, when thinking about which class to take in high school, you want to consider if it might make sense to take more than one class with the same teacher so you can get to, you know, get to know that person um, and they can get to know you better uh, over the course of time. Uh, also participating in class. Teachers will you know, struggle to get to know a student if they never speak up in class. Uh, students want to make sure they've done the prep. Um, and try to be an active participant in classroom discussion. You know, don't be afraid to ask for clarification or help on a concept if needed, or other people probably have the same question, right? So you're also speaking for other people who are not as bold as you are, brave as you are to ask the question. Uh, also ask for guidance outside of class. Asking for guidance, you know, um, you know, outside the, the classroom hour, uh, the classroom context shows teachers that students, you know, respect them, care about the subject that they teach, 
Um, a student might want to ask a teacher to help um, you know, them understand a tricky concept, request additional reading to deepen their knowledge, or, or ask to talk about careers in a field related to the subject. I often say to students that, you know, in many ways, your grades and your transcript are reflective of the relationships that you have with your teachers. And the students who go and see their teachers outside of class often do best in class. Um, mm -hmm. Also, you want to talk about you know, your life and goals, you know, teachers who get to know students on a more personal level and who understand and can become invested in the students' goals and aspirations are more likely to advocate strongly for that student and let us a recommendation. They may also have valuable insights into the students, um, you know, and how they can resolve problems or reach their goals. Um, you know, additionally, you know, join an activity that, that the teacher maybe coaches. Um, so this is another great way to build a relationship, um, you know, getting to know them in context outside the classroom um, and maybe even outside the school walls, um, you know, joining the team that they coach, the activity they advise um, can also allow teachers to see the other side of you as well as you of them. And then also counselor relationships. Guidance counselors also play a huge role in vouching uh, for students in the college admissions process that Michael will talk about in a second. And students and counselors typically have fewer opportunities to build a relationship that, that lead to highly persuasive recommendations um, than, than you may think. Um, since you know, most guidance counselors are charged with looking over a huge number of students, they can't go out of their way to get to know each student individually. Um, you know, therefore, students want to take the initiative to create a relationship with their guidance counselor, ideally starting, you know, um, during a less busy time of the year, what that time is, maybe Michael could talk about that, um, but Michael would love to kind of hear your, your thoughts on this idea of the relationships and connections with teachers and counselors. It, it's interesting, you know, obviously you hit a lot of the key points in terms of that. I'm always fascinated by the junior in high school who getting to the end of junior year and says to me, who should I ask to write my letters of recommendation? And then I realized that we didn't do a good job with that student because the things that you're talking about right here are exactly what that student should have done. And I always try to make sure when I was working in a school and even when I'm working privately now that you need to be thinking about this at the beginning of the junior year in particular. But one of the examples used before, and I love, I love the kid who had a teacher as a freshman and then has that teacher again as a junior or a senior who can really talk about the growth that they see in the student and how they've matured. And to me, that's one of the great letters of recommendation because they can really give a perspective of then and now. And I think if there's that opportunity, that's great. So if you can build that relationship and have that opportunity later on, that's great. You know, I think the idea that in terms of building that relationship over time is really important. You stressed the point before, and I think that's one of the dangers, unfortunately, of some of the schools that our kids go to, is that there are guidance counselors who are overwhelmed, that they do have to write all these letters. The bulk of the letters that guidance counselors have to write come in the fall for students that are going to apply early. They're spending October getting those letters ready for the November 1 students, for those students that are going to do the January 1 applications. Guidance counselors and teachers are many times writing these letters over the Christmas holidays to get them ready in time. So as you said before, getting to know these people earlier in the process, you know, if there's an opportunity the year before to interact with them more, to help them get to know you in terms of what they're going, you know, and there are many times where I knock off the letters when I was at Poly Prep in terms of college counseling, I knocked off the letters in the summer of the kids who I knew. I got ahead of the game because I knew these kids well, and all I did, was wait to see, tell me more about what you did during the summer, which I could add to their letter at that point. So I think in many ways, exactly what you're saying, these relationships that you build up over time are going to be some of the best letters of recommendation, whether it's from a college counselor or whether it's from the teachers they have. So Michael, um, with respect to initiating a relationship with, uh, with one's guidance counselor uh, in high school, if the fall is when guidance counselors are kind of inundated with uh, rec letters, right? When do you think would be an ideal time um, for a student to start to make the connections with their guidance counselor um, before that? Is it the summer, over the summer they reach out when school's out of session? I always, I always joke that my favorite time of the year was January and February because college decisions haven't come out yet. The college counselors have written all their letters. There's not that much that they can do during that. I used to always take a vacation in either January or February because I knew it was a time where there wasn't going to be that much stress on me in terms of things that had to get done. So I would advise a student in the early 
kind of the early part of the year, the January, February, and even almost into March when college decisions start to come out is a great time to kind of build this relationship with a guidance counselor who might just be sitting around the office without as much to do as they normally would have had in the fall. The fall's the worst time, you know, to try to build that relationship in the fall as a junior, guidance counselors don't have the time, you know, but after, you know, the first of the year, there's plenty of time the rest of that year, your junior year to build that relationship. That's great. Um, thanks so much for answering that question. Mike. That's, a, that's really helpful. Um, so, uh, you know, last part here on making connections, uh, you know, contacts in the industry, as well as in uh, academia, um, you know, it's never too early for high schoolers to network, um, even informally. So, um, you know, to start with, your student might want to speak with family friends who have done things they're interested in, such as working in a relevant field or going to a particular college or pursuing similar, uh, you know, hobbies and so on. Um, if the student has a deep interest in a particular academic field that they cannot explore any further in school, they may want to reach out to a professor at a local college, you know, whether it's with questions, um, you know, comments on a paper, um, offers to help out in the lab over the summer, you know, uh, and so on. Um, you know, we've known high school students to land informal internships and college letters of recommendation in this way, and it's so it, it's certainly worth the time. Um, you have to invest it to do it. And then similarly, students who you know, might wish to reach out to companies or professionals in their fields of interest to ask for advice, job shadowing opportunities, or even mentorship. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next section. Um, and finally, an, an, an evergreen tip for any kind of internship, work experience, or job shadowing opportunity, send a thank you note afterwards. Um, and do try to keep in touch after that. You, know, you want these people to remember who you are. Um, so, Michael, uh, moving on to the next sort of segment. No, here. Hold on one second, Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want anything to add? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you were <laughs> the one that pointed this out to me. The new dean of admissions at the University of Pennsylvania has now said that you don't have to be required anymore to submit two letters of recommendation from teachers, but rather that one of the two letters can be from someone that you've worked with, someone that you internshiped, someone that you worked for. The fact that someone at that high a level of a school will make that recognition starts to tell you how important what you do beyond the school and beyond the classroom can be just as valuable in the college admissions process. You know, there are many students who used to always send that as an additional letter. Penn is now saying that could be one of your primary letters. That's a huge statement by the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, so for anyone who may not be um, as familiar with the process, typically, uh, what Michael is talking about, typically uh, universities look for three letters of recommendation. One is from the guidance counselor, like a Michael Muska, um, you know, at your school who talks about who you are kind of in the community of the school. And then there's two teacher recommendations um, that talk about who you are in the classroom. What Michael's trying to point out here, and he's right, is that University of Pennsylvania and their new dean, who just came from Bowdoin, um, 20 minutes north of where I am right now, um, has actually you know, brought some, you know, an, an, an innovative change to this where you, know, you still have your guidance counselor who talks about who you are in the community, and, but now it's only one teacher recommendation, talking about who you are in the classroom, and then a recommendation from someone outside, it could be anybody, he would talk about you in a different context, and it's going to be treated as seriously um, and as importantly as a recommendation that would have come from a teacher. And that's quite interesting, especially if you're maybe, say, somebody work, you know, applying to, say, the Wharton School of Business, right? Mm -hmm. And has done, like, incredible things at, you know, at a company through an internship or work experience, whether it's one summer or over the course of a number of years. Like, for them to talk about who you are within a professional context um, and how you're able to take your learning that you're taking in school or you're gaining in school and applying it towards real world problems. I mean, that really shows a place like UPenn, not just your promise on campus, but also beyond it and what kind of alumni you might be. So, um, Michael, thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, it's a tremendous point. Um, all right, so our, our last segment here before uh, Q&A. So taking advantage of extracurriculars. Um, so we discussed sort of earlier, how a sense of purpose and vision helps students uh, to self-regulate, uh, to build character and succeed in education, and a student's purpose starts with their passions. In previous webinars, quite a few, we've gone into detail on uncovering passions and how to translate these passions into marketable extracurriculars and projects. Um, you know, Michael and I would recommend that you go back to our, uh, our two, two webinars that we did in particular, the first from July 22nd of 2020, 
It covers how to identify extracurriculars to build a persuasive college application narrative. And, uh, and, and the second one is from November 24, 2020. Uh, we do a deep dive on summer programs for high schoolers, which frankly is very appropriate right now because some of the most competitive summer program, um, uh, summer programs are actually open right now and their application are due as early as like November 1st. So uh, I don't want to repeat that content today. I wanted to direct you toward those other resources, but I do want to talk specifically about how extracurricular passions can help your student fulfill the objectives we've been discussing in this webinar. So We'll start by talking about the value of extracurriculars. Uh, a few points here. Number one, making memories. In many regards, extracurriculars are what make a student's time in high school uh, most worthwhile. While a student might forget or need to relearn much of what they cover in the classroom, the experience of editing the school newspaper or captaining the math team is likely to stick with them for years and decades to come. Uh, also discovering passion and purpose, like we've been talking about quite a bit today, uh, by trying out a variety of interests interest in extracurriculars early in high school. Students are able to explore their interests and narrow down uh, things to, to a few they feel really passionate about, at which point, you know, clearer goals and aspirations for the future may emerge. And in turn, the concept of benefits for motivation and confidence uh, discussed earlier, you know, come in. Also building skills, uh, extracurriculars shouldn't, you know, only be viewed as resume building activities. They're also an invaluable opportunity for students to develop and practice the real world skills that they may not uh, have gained in the classroom setting. Uh, these school skills can include things like you know, goal setting, um, uh, teamwork, time management, prioritization, problem solving, analytical thinking, leadership skills, public speaking. And when you're deciding on which extracurricular activities to explore or to commit to, students should have in mind not only what might look good on a college application, but uh, also like, you know, which skills they're most eager to develop. So for instance, a student who is shy or lacking confidence may find a great, you know, utility in an extracurricular such as debate or, or like a performance art, you know, like, like a theater or a dance that forces the work on these skills in a supportive environment. And then finally, sort of improving performance in school, uh, participating in activities they're passionate about can increase students' brain function help them better concentrate and manage time, all of which contribute to higher grades. Uh, in fact, several studies have found that students who participate in extracurricular activities have higher grades, more positive attitudes towards school, and higher academic aspirations. Michael, anything to add? I'm going to repeat two things from previous seminars, and it ties into a couple of the questions that I've already seen so far today. Okay. First of all, colleges are looking for a well-rounded class, not well-rounded students. And a well-rounded class is a class of a lot of students who have really significant skills that when brought together, they create the kind of class that a Dean of Admissions is looking for. They're not looking for someone who has a plate of many, many activities that they dabbled in, but not did anything of consequence during their time in high school. So I think there's a question later on about all these activities my child should be doing. I use the triangle effect. I've used this before. At the bottom of the triangle is when you're in the eighth and ninth grade and you try lots of different things to figure out what you care about and what you like to do. But that triangle narrows as you go into the 10th grade, the 11th grade, and finally the 12th grade so that you really now have become, as you said a second ago, Chris, a leader in that activity, very involved in that activity, passionate about that activity, and you're able to show that in your application, and that's what college deans of admissions are looking for. So it's a perfect segue um, into uh, the Q&A because there's a couple of uh, questions that kind of came in in the registration that we want to hit on. And again, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A panel. Um, in your, your Zoom interface, and we'll, we'll get to them as they, as they kind of pop up. Um, Michael, there's a question that kind of came in, which I'll handle quickly, which is when's a good time to start preparing for the SAT uh, or the ACT? I always say to, to, to families, you want to probably do your SAT versus ACT diagnostic no later than spring of sophomore year in high school um, to decide which test is going to probably be the better fit and then um, to start preparing the summer before junior year, or, or at least to you know, gain some insight uh, as to whether preparing over the summer before junior year makes sense. 
So that's a, you know, when you want to do your diagnostic and kind of answer the question and learn about the process. And then either starting somewhere between sophomore and junior year or beginning of junior year. And, you know, we have some people who start the SAT versus ACT diagnostic process. And, you know, when Michael's not doing anything in, in January or February, um, and then they start to prepare for uh, the actual exam beginning uh, later that spring. Um, that's really the, the earliest. I mean, Michael, do you have anything that you want to add to that um, from your perspective? I found it interesting in working with athletes in particular that mm -hmm. the PSAT is something that a lot of families overlook. The PSAT yeah. they take in just about every school in the country and certainly in the city of New York in October of their sophomore year and October of their junior year. A lot of kids think it's a joke. They don't realize that, you know, because they're forced to take it, they don't really put any kind of effort or significance in it. And the students that I've worked to in the time frame you're talking about, Chris, I've actually said to them in the summer before their junior year, do a little bit of prep work for the PSAT, because that will also help you become more comfortable with the concept of taking the SAT later on. But also the PSAT is the national merit exam. And for a student who'd like another thing to put on their resume when they apply to college, to be a national merit semifinalist because they did well on the PSAT is certainly a feather in their cap in terms of when they apply to college. So I think that starting point you're talking about, Chris, summer before junior year, I think is incredibly significant. I don't like students who wait much longer than that. And I'm gonna add something to this from a tutor's perspective that may not seem so um, uh, obvious or may not occur to people who aren't like deep in test prep, which is what's cool about what Michael's saying with the PSAT, the PSAT is a real test, right? And there's actual stakes and it's a testing environment. It's not simulated. It is a testing environment that is happening, you know, you know most likely in your school, or I guess usually where you're taking. What's incredibly valuable from a test prep perspective is looking at how you perform on the actual PSAT vis-a-vis -vis how you were preparing, how you were trending in your mock tests before the PSAT. So for example, the PSAT is at a 1520. If you're trending at like say a 1400, going into the, the real PSAT, because you've gotten a 1400, you know, on your last two mock exams, right before the actual test, and you get a 1400 on the actual PSAT, then we know that wherever you're trending going into a real test is probably where you're gonna end up. That said, if you go into the PSAT after trending at 1400 and get a 1360, that's frankly completely acceptable. And often people see a drop off, but then knowing that if we're trying to break 1400 on the, on the real SAT, we probably wanna make sure that you're, you're well above 1400 because there might be a bit of a drop off. Finally, if you're trending at 1400, you take the PSAT and you get like a 1460, then maybe you're a money player. And we know that wherever you're trending going into the actual exam, you might actually be able to outperform your trend. These are all things that are very useful and helpful in building student confidence, in informing preparation. Um, and so, it, you know, in that respect, the PSAT is a, is a critical component or can be a critical component in the success in your, in your testing journey. One so. more thing, one more thing, Chris. College coaches will normally ask a student for their PSAT score because they know that many of the students they're recruiting have not taken the ACT, have not taken the SAT, but they wow. can get a ballpark figure of where the student will fall because they know the student had to take the PSAT in their school. And so again, for someone who's a junior who hopes to be recruited, taking the PSAT seriously is really important. Yeah, this is just another reason, Michael, why, um, you know, I know it's in our queue of um, sort of upcoming uh, webinars, but uh, doing the athletes, um, you know, webinar and, and specifically the testing aspect of that is uh, I, maybe we should accelerate that timeline. Mm -hmm. um, so, all right. So the next question over here, um, how do we help our high school students get prepared and focused while still feeling balanced and happy in school? Um, we have certainly addressed that um, in this webinar, hopefully to your satisfaction, but Michael, Anything else that you want to say about that question? Again, how do we help our high school students get prepared and focused while still feeling balanced and happy in school? It's pretty much what you spoke about for the first 30 minutes of this <laughs> webinar in terms of, of how to do that. So I think you did a great job answering that question. And I think as parents, hopefully you walk away from this today having learned some of these points that you then can apply in terms of working with your students. 
children. Right. So, the, so then we'll, we'll move on now to the next question, Michael, uh, which is how do I get my child to engage in more activities after school during our COVID or in our COVID environment? Well, you know, the thing we were talking about before in terms of students taking initiative to showing perseverance in terms of moving forward and doing things. I think we're at the point now that we're slightly beyond the COVID world of that question, okay? You know, and I think it's now getting back into activities. I've had a number of students I've worked with who were doing things when they were freshmen and sophomores, couldn't do them as juniors, and now they're getting back into them as seniors. And I think encouraging your children to get into back into things they were doing because that shows continuity from a college admissions point of view. At the same time, jumping into something new that you're really excited about that perhaps you dwelled in while you're in the COVID year certainly can be something and be able to talk about that. During my year off, I had a student who decided to learn Japanese on their own. And now all of a sudden they're taking Japanese at the college level in their senior year in high school because of that. What a great story for a college in terms of this kid taking that kind of initiative and now being excited about traveling to Japan sometime in the near future. So I think that parents shouldn't be pushing their children into things just to push them into it. They should be encouraging them to pick up things they care about, they're excited about, and they enjoy. And to add to the, your note about the student who picked up Japanese during, during COVID, um, you know, I'll point this out, and people may not be aware of this, um, if this is their first time through the process, or you know, have, didn't go through the process literally last year, but Common App has added a COVID-19 essay prompt. And that essay prompt, um, it's optional, it's 250 words. And you know, one of the things that you can do at that prompt is talk about how the experience of a COVID has maybe influenced your academic interests and or uh, career interests. And so Michael, your um, anecdote about the student teaching themselves Japanese and now taking Japanese you know, um, you know, at a higher level in, 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 in 12th grade, um, that's the exact kind of story that you can be putting into that prompt that really kind of shows, again, grit, perseverance, challenging yourself, trying new things, trying hard things. And make sure you've shared that with your guidance counselor so that right. the guidance counselor then has it in their letter as well so that there's a recognition of what this student did during that period of time. So Michael, next question here, what happens when your school stops using the AP courses through the college board? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting that a lot of schools in New York, for whatever the reason, I won't name the names of the schools, but have decided they have moved in that direction. One of their arguments has been, and in part of it, I don't disagree, is that schools that have the AP, the teachers are required to teach to the test. In other words, there is a set basically program they have to follow in terms of what they're gonna teach in the class. And then the student is basically asked to be tested on that material. I have to agree that in many ways, I'm not a fan of the APs just for that very reason. I'm not a fan of the old subject tests or the SAT that used to be in place for the very same reason. So I think that in many ways, I wouldn't be nervous about the fact of what takes place because remember one thing, colleges will judge a student based on what's offered by their high school. So in other words, a student who goes to a school that has dropped the AP, that high school's responsibility in its profile, which is its statement of what they teach and why they teach it, is going to say to a college, we don't teach APs anymore, or we never taught APs. And a student's not going to be judged by the fact that they don't have APs on their transcript. That being said, I've worked with a number of kids who have gone off on their own, studied for the AP, taken the AP test, and done well on it as well, too. And there are many schools where you can take an AP in an outside situation as well, if that's something you really want to do. But a student will not be penalized for the fact that their school does not teach APs. Um, I mean, expertly uh, put there, Michael, um, and I just want to kind of point out that if you're taking like an honors course or a really kind of rigorous course in uh, a subject related to or in um, the College Board's catalog of AP uh, tests, frankly, um, and we've been doing this for quite a while, you know, just a little bit of support, uh, a little bit of preparation and understanding how the test tests knowledge and what it wants you to do with respect to the rubric 
um, you know, after two hours, after a full year of U.S. history, and you know, two hours of um, of insight, and how to write like a DBQ um, or an essay, you're going to probably be fine. So uh, appreciate that, Michael. So just a few more questions here. Um, the answer might be embedded in the question: If you want to go to a top college, don't you have to kind of cut back or eliminate, you know, all the time uh, you waste by hanging out online? Shouldn't you be replacing that time? online with studies and clubs and service? I mean, Michael, is there anything to say other than <laughs> you're correct? Absolutely. I mean, you're right. The answer is embedded in the question in terms of that. And I think what's tough is, you know, parents sometimes feeling they have to, you know, ride roughshod over their child for spending too much time on their computer and social media or too much time playing games on their computers, you know, which could be valuable time in terms of many of the things we talked about today. And I, you know, you know, I wish you well on that, you know, and I think that many of the reasons I have parents sometimes hire me to do what I do is they let me be the bad cop instead of themselves being the bad cop. That's not why you should be hiring me in terms of that. You should be hiring <laughs> me to help build the passions, the things that your students care about in terms of making them apply a good application. I'll just simply add, going back to this idea of building a routine, I mean, you know, you know, both of my uh, daughters are, I mean, seventh grade, fifth grade, they're young, but even now we've built a routine for when they can go on the iPad. Mm -hmm. You know, they know when it is, they know when it's not. And just sort of like giving them the opportunity to sort of like scratch that itch or feed that, that, that desire it makes it so much easier to basically manage them and say, Hey, you know what, it, you know, your iPod time, your iPad time is up mm -hmm. and they get it. So also, I don't know if it's about eliminating, you know, uh, online gaming or fun whatever but really putting a structure around it right mm -hmm. um and treating it as something that's important to your to your child right it goes Just back into the time it goes back chris it goes back into your concept of time management yeah exactly. put in a block of time for that that they know they have that block but they just can't do it at random whenever they feel like doing it so the next two questions michael are going to be a little more specific about extracurriculars but with, with sort of an interesting kind of twist on them um or yeah you know, uh, angle how do you choose from extracurriculars when your student wants to do too many things, sports, mm -hmm. dance, clubs, et cetera? Michael, how do you advise the kid who quote unquote wants to do it all? Yeah, you know, Chris, that's one of the most difficult things is there are students who think they can do it all. They think they can specialize in every course when they start talking about what they want to major in in college. They think they can do all these kinds of activities. And I don't know if there's a simple answer to that. You know, the question is, making sure that the student is able to do well in the things that they want to do well in. And I think if lesser activities start to take away from being successful in more important activities, that goes back to what we were talking before in terms of focus and passion and being really good at a couple things instead of being a dabbler in too many things. And I know that's hard for a student to hear sometime, you might have to enlist some help perhaps with your guidance counselor to encourage the student to kind of think about that as well too. You know, but yeah. unfortunately I, there's no simple answer to that. Yeah, I mean, the I'll just add one thing to this. Um, I think working with, talking with somebody about, you know, all the different things that you want to do, who maybe is able to kind of connect the dots to help you understand where your attention and time is really kind of best focused. And it might be in something that's like a hybrid of, the things that you want to do, right? Or they might be able to identify uh, an underlying theme that maybe leads you in a new direction to a new club or a new activity that does all, that kind of borrows elements from the things that you want to be doing or say you want to be doing and does it in a much more meaningful way. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll say about this is simply like, the first thing for me that usually I ask about, um, we're thinking about maybe kind of cutting back or retiring certain activities really is, is sports, which might be like a controversial talk, topic for some people. But like, if you're on a, on, a, on a sport team or you play a sport and you're not like contributing, you know, heavily and effectively to the team's success, you're like riding the bench or whatnot. And you're not, certainly not being recruited to, to do that in college. I don't, there's certainly value there. I mean, I think you have, to, you have to look at that because it's not probably the best use of your time. So um, it's, it's rare and unusual that a college coach or a college will be recruiting a student for two sports. 
they're going to look for the sport they're really good at and that they can contribute to the college team as part of that team on the campus. And I think for a student to hang on to another sport when that time could be used more valuably for, I hate to say, test preparation, community service, other things that they can be doing, a student may need to step back, go back to look yourself in that mirror and say, I can't do it all, what has to go? We have a, a question here that was entered um, into the Q&A panel uh, from Kelly. Kelly's asking, how can we prep for PSAT? Well, I would say that the best way to prep for the PSAT is to download one of the free, one of the free tests that's on the College Board website. Um, find a place, quiet place, whether it's in your house or maybe a, a room at the library where that library is in your school, which may not frankly be that quiet, or like your local library and take the exam um, as if it was being administered for real. And I think the reason why it's important to, to do that first is you have, to, you have to understand that test preparation, I'll borrow, you know, Michael's talking about his triangle of activities. I'll talk about the equilateral triangle of testing skills. Um, you know, you have content, right? Then you have like test strategy. And then you have like, like you know, test taking skills as far as like focus and endurance. And it's only when you immerse yourself in the actual kind of like simulated testing environment where all three of those pieces come into, you know, come into effect uh, in every single moment. And doing that will help you then understand where you're strong, where you need to like, you know, uh, make improvements, where you have to practice. And that helps you understand what you probably want to do, you know, before any test, but particularly the PSAT, right? So say, Kelly, that you sit and you do that practice PSAT and you realize, oh my God, I got like, you know, uh, a pretty good score. I had a really hard time finishing sections. I wasn't really getting a lot of questions wrong. I, I was having a hard time um, um, sort of just, you know, managing, uh, you know, myself within sections to answer enough questions to maximize my score. That's one need, right? If you didn't have any issue with managing your time in an individual test section, but you were like missing lots of questions and some of those questions were going to be categorized as easies, that might be um, a matter of, you know, better test strategy. OK, um, and then finally, if you're looking at, you know, if you're able to get through the path, get, get through the test sections and also get like most of the easies and mediums uh, correct, you're really kind of struggling on the hards. Well, maybe you have to like focus on advanced content for the PSAT. So it really depends on what the needs are. But to identify the needs, you have to first sit and take like a diagnostic test. So what we normally suggest is people take a diagnostic test. If you want to reach out to us, we can send one for you. Um, and then we can maybe even uh, send you a, a link to our KTHQ site. You can actually enter your answers in there and then, you know, see where you're, you know, get, get the results, see where you're strong, see where you need to improve. And then if you want to talk about ways to figure out where to prioritize and focus for the next couple of weeks, we're happy to do that. So that's probably what I can say for now. And then we have one more question here, Mike, before we wrap up. Again, on um, you know diversity. Uh, sorry, extracurriculars. How much diversity is important in extracurricular profiles? I think that if you've got an activity or two that you're passionate about and have done really well, and you complement that with something in community service to show the kindness aspect of who you are, I think that's the key in terms of having a strong application. I think a student who's a, a really outstanding athlete. Colleges recognize the time commitment students have to make to that particular activity. And as a result, they know they don't have the time to do a laundry list of other activities. And so as a result of that, doing a couple of things really well is much better than doing five or six things mediocrely. Right. Um, so those are all the questions, Michael. And so I just wanted to uh, share this with people, this, this promotion. So please, you know, you're welcome to book your two hour high school strategy session. Uh, in this session, we can discuss your students' passions, interests, and vision for college and career. We can discuss specific, you know, you know, queries related to your student's class schedule. We can answer any questions about maximizing your student's high school experience or successful college applications. We can even talk about the PSAT if you want and how to prepare for that. Um, webinar attendees, we know who you are because you registered. Um, you're able to save 50% uh, on the session by using the code EDGE50. So um, please feel free to take advantage of that. 
And also, thank you very much for attending. I'm Chris Jamie, and I'm joined by Michael Muska uh, once again. Um, and we thank you for, for joining us today. Michael, do you have any final thoughts on how to make the most out of high school? Find your passion. I think if you can find something that you're passionate about, and passion can be in any kind of different realm. It could be as a language student. It could be as a chess player. It could be as an athlete. It could be as a musician or a thespian but find something that you really are passionate about and you're excited about because in a typical college interview, the interviewer is gonna to say to you, what are you passionate about? And all that I'll add is that from a parent perspective, um, you know, are you modeling pursuing your passions for your child? Um, and if not, you know, self-reflect, give yourself some positive self-talk um, and uh, you might be surprised and inspired to see where it goes. So uh, again, thanks for joining us. We'll be back again in a few weeks with another event. Um, this was a great talk, Michael. Thanks so much for your time. And to everyone out there in the viewing audience, thank you for your time. Have a great night and talk soon. See ya.